I bring you greetings, amen, from Providence Church of God in Christ from our pastor, Marshall Newsom. We are here on this Sunday morning, glad to be here. Hallelujah, going into the word of God, being able to feast on the word of God this morning. And um, we welcome you, we welcome you, we welcome you. We are glad to have you on this morning, sitting around the table to feast of the Lord. We are gonna have a little word of prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, oh God, we thank you for your goodness and kindness. We acknowledge you in all of our ways, Father. We realize that without you, we can do nothing. We can't breathe, we can't walk, we can't talk. And so, Father, we want to say thank you. We want to thank you for allowing us to see another day, God. We ask that you bless our land, God. Bless our hearing, God. Oh, God, let us open up our hearts and our mind and our spirit, Father, that we will hear what the Spirit has to say unto the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to prolong the time, but amen. We're talking about tradition and love. Coming out of uh, the book of so Song of Solomon, um, chapter 4, verse 8 through the fifth chapter, the first verse, the, part, the first part of it. And um, the Bible truth is talking about how God ordained and committed relationships. And we know we have a lot of relationships, not just a marriage relationships, but we have uh, friendships with people. And we have working relationships. We have um, relationships with our girlfriends or our boyfriends. And so our memory verse says, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. And that is the memory verse. And we're going to see how the north and the south wind come together. We know that opposites attract. And it is a good thing because it helps us. What um, the Bible says that two are better than one. And maybe what one person don't think of, the other person does. So it's good to not be the same. God made nobody the same. Nobody thinks alike. So it's a good thing. And we'll see how the north and the south wind are going to come together. And as I was studying this lesson, I thought about the male and the female. And how when you get into the lesson, how at the end, the beauty of it, they come together in a spirit of love. And by the end of this lesson, we will discuss that beauty and wonder of love in a committed relationship. And it says for us to reflect on our attitude about love, not somebody else to reflect, but we are to take our own personal self-examination and reflect on love and commitment. And then we are going to explain how to build a relationship that honors a marriage commitment. And then our background scriptures are what I'm going to um, go, going to be the lessons is coming from on today. And as we look at it, um, let me go to um, the light on the word. It says in biblical times, Couples did not meet, date, fall in love, and then marry. Rather, marriage was a vastly different four-step process that had little to do with emotional involvement. And we know in this day and time, that ain't even true. Most people get involved emotionally first because they do things that they should not do before marriage, which is called fornication, having, married, um, having sex without being married. Marriage was an arranged contract between... Um, between two families who sought alliances with each other for various social, territorial, or financial reasons. The, bride, the bridegroom's father paid a bride price. That was the betrothal period. The betrothal period is not the same as an engagement. But throttle, um, the, the bride or the groom didn't even have anything to do with it. It was the two fathers that came together and um, the, the, uh, the father of the bride, he took the uh, price for her just in case if they decided to back out. So if he decided to back out, he was already paid for him not, his son not marrying 
that bride. So as they worked on that agreement, that was the betrothal period. And so, uh, but he had paid for it. And you will see um, that after that time, that the, after that betrothal period, the groom would be prepared, be prepared for the home and the future bride prepared for her new responsibilities as a wife. And then sex between the couple could happen, but not before that time. We see that in Genesis 29 and 21, after uh, Jacob had served seven years for Leah, and then he also served seven years for Rachel, he told Laman, now give me my wife. You know, he was entitled now to sleep with her. So, as we look at the light on the word, we see the betrothal period. And as we look at the lesson and we look at those first two verses, which talks about um, the lesson is divided into three parts. The first part of the lesson is talking about an invitation to love. And so when we look at verses uh, eight and nine in the lesson, it says, Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon, look from the top of Ammon, a manna, from the top of Shanir and Harmon, from the lion's den, from the mountains of the leopards. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. So when we look at this, it says that it's talking about how that the man is so in love with her. And you know how when you fall in love with a person at first sight, you just can't hardly stand to be without them. They can just leave and, and, and just got to wherever they going and they calling you or you calling them. And they just left, ain't even been 10 minutes. And this is how um, the, the, the groom was feeling uh, in this particular two verses, he was saying that um, it seems like you're so far away from me. In the lesson, it talks about how that um, in Israel, Lebanon, the country of the immediate north of Israel, Shanir or Hama is a mountain range that extends from Lebanon, and it includes Mount Hamana. This text creates the perception of separation by distance. So even though they're not that far, that's how it says that he felt in his mind. He felt like that she was just that far away from him. And that's why he was saying, come. And it's the same thing God tells us. He said, come unto me. God is always giving us an invitation to come because he love us like that. And so it's the same thing with the love of a man and a woman. God has always has said that we are his bride and we are in a covenant relationship with our God. He, he, we have been bought with a price and we are no longer our own. And in that same sense, you know, God feels so far from us and we should also feel far from God that we want to just draw in his presence. We want to come in the presence of the Lord. We want to be with God, even though we just got out of his presence. And that's just how this groom felt. Even though they felt like they were so far apart when they really wasn't. And you think about when you was first, you know, you met your mate, your husband, or if you're dating and how, you know, you're constantly holding hands. You can't hardly uh, be apart from each other. And I thought about this question. It says um, in here, uh, it had a question with that first verse. It says, what informal sentence can you see to express the feelings uh, in verse 8 and 9? And so I said, you know, I pondered on it. I thought about that question. How he said, you ravished my heart, meaning that he was so passionate for her and so in love with her. You know how when you see somebody, um, you just fall in love with them at first sight. I mean, you, you, you know, you just want them. And that's what he was. He said that my heart is just beating for you. That was the passion that he had for her. And Physically, even though they wasn't that far apart, 
He says, it seems like you're in another country. My mind is constantly on you. That's how it is when you in love. And that's how it is with us. You know, the Bible tells us to keep our mind on the Lord. And when we love God, we keep our mind on the Lord. And when we're in love with our mates, we're constantly thinking about them. We're constantly thinking about how to please them. We see that in the uh, lesson in Genesis um, 1, 26 and 7, when God uh, through 31, it talks about how God had made Adam. And then he told Adam, you know, to subdue the land. And he gave him, you know, uh, all of the food, the herb bearing seeds and all of those things. And then we skip to the second chapter and we see that God did the first ceremony. He did the first marriage. We see that in that second chapter, he took a real around the seventh verse. He took a rib from um, Adam and he made a woman. And when he woke Adam up, the ceremony took place and God walked his daughter, which we are his daughters. And think about how the father, you know, presented his daughter to Adam. Walked her down the aisle. Isn't it something to walk with God? God wants us to walk with him. He walked his daughter down, down to Adam and gave her. And he said, you know, now um, you are no longer one, but you have become two. And as I thought about that, and in that sense, marriage, when you join together, there has to be, um, I think it's Isaiah, talks about come and let us reason together. In that sense, I thought about when you get married, it's not all about what you want. You supposed to consider the other person. It's about pleasing them and they also is about pleasing you. And so when we do that, we can have good harmony in the relationship. And so we see that as God put them together, he said that they was no more one, but they had become, they were no more two, but they had become one flesh. He had joined them together. He had united them together. And that's what love is. Love is unifying. Love connects us. Love does not separate us. Um, we'll talk about that when we look at because it's impossible to talk about love and don't talk about uh, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. Everybody knows that that's the love chapter. Hallelujah. So, you know, you get excited when you're talking about love because your heart beat, you're happy, you're smiling. You know, everything uh, shows it. You know, even um, people can tell when you're in love because they say, mm, you got a little glow in your eye. You got a little spark in your eye. So you have to do what it takes to keep that love flowing. And so as we um, go on to um, the next part of it, we also want to look at that how that uh, he called her the love. God is always making an invitation. That's the main thing. An invitation was given uh, in a relationship. There has to be an invitation. Somebody has to invite somebody out. Somebody have to say, come. Will you come and go out with me? Jesus said, come and dine with me. He always made an invitation. Come and fellowship with me. Come and hang out with me. Even when um, he went to Zacchaeus' house, he went and hung out with him. But Jesus always said, come. In Isaiah, he tells us to come. Come to the waters and drink of the waters. Even at the well, he told the woman, he said to drink of this water. He gave her an invitation to drink. So God is always saying to come. And that's the love of God. We see not only the love that God put in this institution between a man and a woman, but also he want us to see that's the same love he had for us. He's always beckoning us 
to come. He's always asking us to come and fellowship with me. Take a little time out of your day. Come and sup with me, the Bible says. He says, if you sup with me, mean to spend some time with me. And as you sup with me, I'll sup with you. The only way to get to know a person is to spend a little time with them, learn their heart, learn what's on their mind. And that's how God wants us to be with each other. And that's in all of our relationships. When we look at our relationships, our friendships, we um, want to love those in our friendships. Uh, that's why he tells us to bear one another in love. That means we have to have some patience. That means that people sometimes going to get on our nerve. But let's just turn it around. We sometimes get on people's nerve. But he says bear one another in love. So we stay in love. When we get out of our love walk, then we see all of the flaws. We see all of the things that are not right. We see, we start criticizing. When you get out of love, you start seeing all of the faults. But if we get back in love, the Bible says that love covers, covers. You don't even see it. The flaws was there when you first met. But you know what? You didn't see it. You know why? Because love was there. When love is there, you don't see it. You only see it when you step out of love so what we have to do is step back in love and it's the same thing with god when we get out of god that's what he sees our sin because the blood is not covered no more but when we in love and we are walking right the blood covers god doesn't see any sin and it's the same thing in the natural so as we move to the and as i looked at this it talked about because uh, I did want to say this, um, on Monday, how we read, and it talked about how God had blessed them and provided everything uh, for them in this union. And that's what God does. He provides for us spiritually, mentally, emotionally. And the same way he gave him everything in the garden, he also do the same thing for us. We don't have any lack in Christ. We do not. Say that. We do not have any lack in Christ. Now, if you're out of Christ, you may be experiencing some lack somewhere in your life. But in Christ, I say it is impossible. He provided everything. When he put him in the garden, everything that he needed was there. And in Christ, everything, God has given us everything that pertaineth unto life, that's in 1 Peter or 2 Peter, that pertaineth unto life and godliness. And then on Tuesday, we see how he performed the first marriage. I got ahead of myself. That's what we talked about on Tuesday when we read, you know, the scriptures that support the lesson. I talked about how he joined them together. That was on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, uh, it talked about in marriages, we have to look at, it talked about the consequences of being unfaithful. And we know that's not a good thing. That's in the spirit and in the natural. When you go a horn, it talked about in Jeremiah 3, verses 1 through 5, it used a metaphor of uh, Jeremiah, God telling him about how Israel, his first love, how Israel, how he had done brought them out of Egypt, how he had delivered them, and God loved them, went and rescued them, and that's what God does for us. He came and rescued us, delivered us out of our sin, and after he have saved us and cleaned us up and made something up out of us, then we go stepping out. Isn't it something how you date somebody and they want nothing for you, got them, didn't nobody want them? Get <laughs> Then you dress them up, put them on some clothes, fatten them up. You know, they ain't have nothing. You know, you don't put some clothes on them and got them all fattened up, done fed them all good. They got a little pot belly and, you know, and now they look, you know, help them pick out some clothes and done upgrading them a little bit. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, now after you done got them fixed up and got them looking like something, then they step out. And the same thing, sometimes after God done did all this for you, done blessed you, and now you go stepping out 
on God. And this was the illustration he used that um, how that now when you do that, there are some consequences. And God says, now this is God. And he, he can get a little rough when he talk about stuff. Because he said, now you stepping out, acting like there's no, like nothing has happened. He said, all you doing is just polluting the land. And that's what happened. When you step out of your relationship, you're just polluting your household. Everybody is affected by what you do. And so God's saying that you have polluted. You're just like a prostitute that's sitting on a corner. You can go read Jeremiah for yourself. It says it just like that. It's plain. God makes it very plain. He said you're just like a prostitute sitting on a corner waiting on some clients. And that's what a prostitute do, wave and, and, and be waving. Come on, waiting for him to come by. And he says, that's what you're doing. You done been around the block and back. Now walk that corner to that corner. That's what happened when you step out. And he says, you have solicited many lovers. Now, this is God, uh, Jeremiah using this illustration talking about Israel, but it was actually asking Judah, are you going to be just like Israel? Are you going to step out? Are you going to go around the block? You're going to be just like your sister. That's what he would call Israel. You're going to be just like your sister. You're just going to pollute the whole land. And you know you're foul because no woman, no man wants there. And it says that in this instance, um, you marry your husband, then you go out, you play the field, or you go marry somebody else. Then you want to go back to your first husband. He said, you polluted. You done went around the block, now you want to come back like ain't nothing happened. It's the same thing when you cheat. Let me put it out there. When you cheat, you want to act just like ain't nothing happened, and then you want to come back and think everything's supposed to be hunky-dory. Oh, no, there are some consequences that you have to deal with for your actions, and it's the same thing with God. You got to come back and repent. You just can't come back and just jump in where you left off at when you done turned away from the Lord. You done stepped out on God. And so he said, then you act like nothing happened, like there is no shame. But there are consequences. I know for myself, when you're married, who wants somebody else? Let me talk about that little cheating thing a little bit different because I don't experience that. Who wants somebody, you know, who wants... Um, their husband touching somebody like they touch you, kissing on somebody like they kiss you, saying the things, you know, that's your intimate, that's special. And it's the same thing. They don't want nobody touching you. If they think you're showing a little too much, let some guys come over and you may just show a little something, not really uh, out the way. They be like, um, don't you think you need to go? Don't you think you need to go put on a house or something? <laughs> you know, so it's the same way. They don't want anybody seeing their goods. Uh, the Bible calls it the garden when we get to it in the next phase. Talks about the garden. Don't know, you know, but nowadays they call it the cookie. But in either way, the garden or the cookie, you know, the garden, it flourishes. They're, what they're prized, what they're looking for. And so uh, you don't want anybody touching your goods, and neither do any woman want anybody touching their goods. We ain't talking about looking. You can look all you want to. We talking about touching and all of that stuff. And the Bible tells us don't touch each other anyway in 1 Corinthians until we get married. Because as sure as you go to touching, this flesh go to rising. Because them touches feel pretty good, y'all. Yes, it do. We must confess. We got to keep it real up in here. And you go to touching, you're going to get in some trouble. So the best thing the Bible says is good for a man not to touch a woman. And that's just keeping it real. Okay, as we go to the second phase, uh, let's look at light on the word. It says, by Solomon's day, many men had strayed from God's one wife designed for marriage. Not just in Solomon's day, but even in this day, I must interject. Most had multiple wives. They don't do that over in this country. Now, there's some places where they do still have more than one wife, but not over here in America. 
Uh, but few, however, could attest to having as many as Solomon had. Solomon had over 700 wives, and you know he couldn't handle all of them. And even today, men can't hardly handle one wife, let alone trying to have a side chick. When you ain't doing what you're supposed to do at home, you don't need no side chick. Let me keep it real. Okay, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That was in 1 Kings 11, 1 through 13. Concubines was considered to be secondary wives. They held a lower social rank than women who bore the title wife. And I don't know why even uh, people that date um, people's husbands, they think they on the same level as the wife. No, you're not. Because the moment the wife find out, he going to drop you. Well, let's keep that real. He going to drop you or he going to shut it down. The moment she find out. So you're never on her level. And I know some people, they think so. They think it's grand, but it's not. And you'll never take her place. If anything, when she get tired of him, she'll just give you to him. <laughs> That's what she'll do. You ain't taking her from him. Because nine times out of ten, when she give him up, he ain't wanting to go. He ready to cut you off, don't want you. But she done already told him, uh-uh, go head on to her. So don't think you taking him. Huh? Because if you've been dating him three years and he ain't left his wife, yeah, that tells you something right there. And let's just keep it real. I think I just throw it out there. Because women have this thing like, he gonna leave her. He telling you that. But you'll be dating him 10 years and he'll still never leave her. And then when he die, you won't get nothing. Maybe but the little children that you had on the outside. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We just got to keep it real because these things do happen. And sometimes the church don't want to talk about stuff. But you got to talk about it. Because you can just rush it under the rug and act like things don't happen. Then you got people sitting in your congregation hurt because you don't deal with stuff or you don't want to make it plain. When, 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 when these topics come up, you want to make it look sweet. And all of it ain't sweet. That's why it talked about on Wednesdays there's consequences when you step outside of your marriage vows. And you must consider the other person. It may seem fun and sneaking while you're doing it. But after you get through sneaking and she find out and she tell you to pack up and go, it ain't sneaking, it ain't fun no more. And that's just keeping it real. Then when we move on to Thursday, and then we're going to go to the second part, hallelujah. This is a lot to cover. But in the second, uh, in Thursday, as we was reading, Hosea talks about um, how God says to Israel, how that even after Israel had did the things it did. Now, God is so loving and so kind. He's always willing to forgive. And this is what happened on Thursday. He's, God says, I want to win her heart back. I want to take her back to that place where I first met her. So sometimes you got to go back and do the things that you did to win that heart. And so God is letting us know this is how you do it. He said, I'm going to take her back to Egypt, down where I delivered her, where I met her, where I fell in love. And he says, because he says that um, I love her. And, um, and he says that we are to love one another. Now, the thing about God, God says that if you love me, then you are to love people. Because when you reject me, you're rejecting God. I am a part of God, and God is in me. God says that when we love him and love people, then we know God. But it says a person on Thursday, as I was reading, and it went to uh, 1 John, and it was talking about how that in there, if uh, a person, 1 John 4, um, 7 through 12, it says that if a person says that, uh, they love God, but then they don't love people who they seem. They have not the love of God in them. It says that person don't know anything about God. You know why you don't know anything about God? Because first of all, God is love. He is love. That's what you would know about God if you really know him. You would really know that God is love. He's wrapped up in love. He is love. So it's impossible to say you love God and then you hate people. You hate his uh, people that he have created. And so it says that he, he says, I'm going to win them back on Thursday. I'm going to um, go back and I'm going to make them. Isn't it something how that, uh, and it is so true. I don't care how many people you dated beforehand, but it says God said, 
Hmm. I'm going to win her heart back. Or I'm going to win his heart back. You know what you got to do to win their heart back. You know what you got to do. And God's saying, that's what I'm doing. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, cherish her soul. And what you do, you do it with compliments. Bitterness, you'll never do it. Uh, pulling up all of the mistakes, you'll never do it. And so he says, I'm going to go and I'm just going to do it with pleasant things. He said, I'm going to do it so that I'm going to make her forget about all them other lovers <laughs> that she ever had. And that's what happens. When you fall back in love again, you forget about all of the other boyfriends, you go to delete them out your contact or, back, or you go to turn them up yeah. and all of those things. And it's the same thing he do. He go to getting rid of, because when you find that one, the rest of them don't matter. And it's the same thing. When you get God, nothing else matters. He is the essence of love. And so when we get God, he's everything. And when you get that one, that relationship, None of the rest of them matters. You forget their name when somebody asks you later on, have you seen their so-and-so? I'm like, who, who, who is that? Because you're so in love with him. You don't forget all about them. And that's the beauty of love. And so it talks about how God it tells us to love one another. And um, that love is the first thing. We got to go back to our first love. And God loves us so much. That's why he sent Jesus. He even sacrificed his son life to give us love. Love is what hung on the cross. And then look at the unselfishness of Jesus who gave his life. Uh, look at how that this thing worked. It's not about what you want. Even in the garden, when it was so hard for Jesus to go on that cross, he still, what did he say? Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He put God first. He put what God wanted first. And that's what I said at the onset. We have to put other people first. Even in our relationships, sometimes we just got to put somebody else's intentions before our own. And that's what God did. He loved us just that much. And then Jesus loved us so much that he took away our sins. And that's what you call real love. To cover your faults, cause we all have them. That's what real love is in a marriage. You cover one another's faults. You don't just pull out everything um, uh, negative about them. As we look at Love Express, then we talked about the dating part of it. Um, and it says, first of all, he meditated on um, his beloved good, good and sweet qualities. And that was verses 10 through 15. I'm gonna read them quickly in your hearing. 10, it says, how far is thy love my sister, my spouse? How much better is thy love than wine? And the smell of thy ointment than all spices. Thy lips, oh my spouse, drop as a honeycomb. Honey and milk are under the tongue. And the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. A garden encloses my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain seal. The plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, campfire with spikenard, spikenard and chiffon, calamus and cinnamon with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all the cheese spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and springs from Lebanon. Go ahead and finish the last two. Awake, O north wind, come down south, blow upon my garden that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. I am coming to my garden, my sister, my spouse. Okay, when we look at uh, phase two of it, it's talking about, we talked about the invitation. Now we're talking about Love Express. When we look at Love Express, he's talking about her um, attributes, her qualities. And when we look at that, he meditated on her good qualities. And that's what we have to do. That's why the Bible tells us in uh, Philippians 4. Um, mm, for, I can't remember. On down there, I want to say around 4 and 10. It tells us to think on whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are just. I know it's in that fourth chapter. But anyway, this is what he did. He meditated on her good qualities. 
and he compared her qualities like wine. He said, it's better than the best wine. He said, you are so delicate and satisfying. My sister, he said, you are so pleasant to look at. When we meditate and we have these compliments, about that person. He said, talking about those spices and ointments, he said that your smell of ointments are like spices. And then in here, it goes through all of the spices, the cinnamon, the chiffon, and talks about how she smells. It's just like an aroma. You know, you, you know when you're thinking about it, the thoughts, you, the, the, the smell that flows through the air. And that's the pleasant thoughts that he had for her. He said, you know, you're just like an exotic perfume. When you think about all of these spices, you think about her, how, or him, vice versa. He said, it's just like a good smell of aroma. All of these spices flowing through the air in my nostrils. And this is how he felt in those verses 10 through 15. It talks about uh, her qualities and that's what we should focus on those qualities we meditate on those qualities and the second part we extol those physical attributes we look at the physical part of them and I know when we when you first start dating you look at how they build and you know when you're a teenager I remember when um, I dated my um, baby's uh, my son's um, father um, you know, when you start dating and you're young, you get to see when they start getting a little hair on their chest and a, a little, you know, and you, you just excited and you just love everything about them. That, you know, that's the teenage look. You love the hair and then you tell when they voice change and all of that. And, you know, you're just so in love. So you just, oh, everything. Oh, God. And we'd be like, oh, God, the way he walk. I hear Kalira. I hear Kalira now. She'd be like, talk mom back up. I said, for what? He had me to go around the block one day. Talking about, oh, I just want to see. <laughs> you just want to see him and this and that. And you're so intrigued about the little hair coming on the chin and the hair. I, look, now that's the, that's the teenage look. But you be liking the hair under the arm and everything. When you're in love, and you notice everything. You be noticing the, the muscles. Yeah, thank you. And the way they eat and everything. And so these are some of the physical things that you look at when you're in love. And he be the same way. He talk about your shape, your body, and how you walk, and how, you know, and all of those things, your eyes. Because, you know, in the lesson it talks about, he talks about her eyes, her neck, you know. And all of these things, we look at all of those physical attractions. And then it says the third thing, we consider the beauty, the joy, the value of that beloved that adds to our life. And we look at the qualities that are brought to the table. Like I said, how that maybe some things that was out of order in you, then that person helped strengthen you in that area. You know, I talked about opposites attract. They help one another. They build one another up. They encourage one another. This is what love does. When we look at it, and then we go on, we see all of those qualities, uh, and we see the metaphors of the, of the um, spices and all of those things, which just talks about it. Then we t it looks at the garden. When the last part of the lesson talks about love and joy. After you have been dated and you don't, uh, you're going through all of that, then it comes a time, the invitation, she done it, accepted your invitation and you're still in the love stage. You're still enjoying one another's company. You're still thinking about one another. Now, you know, you're, you're at the point where you're getting married. This was the last stage where it talks about, now he said he wants to enjoy his garden. And this is where now they can have sex freely. And we know that the bed is undefiled in marriage. Once you marriage, God instituted it. He wants you to enjoy it. And it's a good part of, of the relationship. But it shouldn't be the only thing. And that's why he tell you, don't do it. Fall in love with a person. Um, one scripture says, no, no man after the flesh. Meaning that just fall in love with a person for who they are. You and Because most of the time when you get involved uh, sexually beforehand and then later on you find out you really don't even like each other. But you was just emotionally caught up. 
But if you do it like God says do it, spend time with a person and just getting to know them. You get to learn qualities and things. So, and sex don't even have to be a part of it. And that's how it was in the biblical times. And that's how it still is today. I know society does not say that. But the word of God has not changed, will not change. And God tells us to not fornicate, which is having uh, sex without marriage. But he tells us to date and we can do it healthy. We just don't put our hands on each other like he said. Don't put your place in uncompromising places and things like that. You know what to do. And you teach your daughters what to do. And it's better when you can wait. You know, when you can wait on the Lord. And, um, and those things are good. But anyway, he now he's at the point, and this is where it talks about in that 16. He says, Oh, awake and come, O north wind and south and blow upon my garden. That's the part where it says, now that, that sexual activity, the, the touching, you, you ain't got to wait no more. It's over. That's when the north and the south winds can come together. They can blow the same way. We don't have to be north and south no more. But now they are joined together as one flesh. They can have sex without guilt. They can enjoy one another, have the full aspect of a marriage. And it's the same thing. When we give our life to Christ and we come to him, we can get the fullness of the kingdom. You can't get everything in the kingdom if you're half-stepping, if you're stepping outside of your love walk with God. We must walk in love. And God tells us he's a jealous God. So we can't step out and half-heartedly serve the Lord and want all of the benefits of a marriage with God. We don't get it like that. Same way in the natural. You know, um, when you start stepping out, they'll start withdrawing stuff too. And she will too. I, I, I know whenever things ain't right, they'll start stop doing this and stop doing that because you done violated. And it's the same thing with God. Every time the children of Israel would violate and they would go whoring on the Lord, he let them go right on into captivity. And that's what happens. And so the love is withdrawn, but God is so loving and so kind. And then it tells us, even for single people, it is important to note that the Song of Solomon is applicable for singles as well. The, un the, un the un un angelology of the enclosed garden reminds singles to reserve their intimacy for marriage and to seek other ways to express love when they are in a committed relationship. And that's what it was talking about. The enclosed garden. Men, keep it closed. Don't give him your goodies before time, even if you single. And um, because that's what they want. And if you give it too soon, they'll hit it and go. And so keep it closed. That's what it's talking about. Keeping the garden closed. Keeping it closed. So you have to look beyond the physical attributes of an other person's heart. And that's what I said. Know no man after the flesh. Get to know them as a person. In that dating season, you need you can learn a whole lot. And and if you do that and not learn them after the flesh and, and getting caught up in emotions, you'll find out you got a lot of things in common. But if you get involved emotionally and sexually first, and then you realize you don't like each other, but you just sexually attracted to each other, and then not only that, you might not even want some of the same things. He maybe don't want children, and maybe you do. Or maybe he only wanted two, and you wanted ten. So these things you didn't find out, or maybe they just don't handle their money well, or, uh, or, or they want to do their own thing. Still, you know, you got people get married, and they still... Uh, want to do what they want to do. These things you could have found out if we would did it God's way. No, no man after the flesh. We're wrapping it up. We praise God for the word. Hallelujah. This is such a good lesson. Hallelujah. And it says we're going to go to the prayer. Hallelujah. So when we do it God's way and um, we can enjoy each other without guilt or without shame. In the garden, when he presented them to each other, they was they they was naked and they did not know it, and there was no shame. 
only when we sin and we step out out of God. And so the same way in this marriage, we are married to God. And God wants us to be faithful to him. He don't want us going whoring like Israel did, you know, out on him. But God wants us to be faithful. And he constantly tells us to come to him like he loved us. And so he's always drawing us to him. And God wants us also to desire him the same way. Nobody just wants to be the only one given in a marriage. God, we should just go to God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But we should, the same way we want forgiveness, we also should be forgiven. And this is the beauty of it. We cover um, um, that 13th uh, chapter of 1 Corinthians really covers. It tells you the things that God is and God is not. It's very satisfying. And when we see that um, in that 13th chapter, it tells us what love is, how love is patient, how love is kind. It tells us the things that it's not. You know, it don't try to have its own way. And so when we really look at that 13th chapter of, um, of Corinthians, I admonish all of us to just look in it and just um, ask the Lord to help us to grow a little bit more in our love walk. We all can improve in our love walk. When we gossip about each other, when we say things about each other in any kind of relationship, it draws us away from our love walk. When we're criticizing one another, it draws us away from our love walk. And God is not like that to us. When we're not forgiving to one another, you know, and God tells us, first of all, forgive so that I may forgive you. So, God is really just telling us, you know, I want us to grow in love. And so this is not just about the marriage love, but it's letting us see that the same way that the marriage is set up, he loves us like that. And that's the type of relationship he wants with us. He's drawing us constantly, drawing us to him, telling us to come, fellowship with him. Just remember, God loves you, and he wants you to be just as faithful. He wants you to desire him too, and not just for things you want. And in any relationship, no man or woman wants to be, uh, you just want them for sex or you just want them for their money, but for everything that they bring along with it. And so does God. He wants you to love him, not just for the things he do for you. And so I just admonish all of us to let's just grow a little deeper in our love walk. In areas where we stepped out and we see God is dealing with our heart, maybe in offenses, maybe in unforgiveness, whatever area it is that we have stepped out, maybe when we're talking about people, we're out of our love walk. When we're um, bashing our um, sisters and brothers, when we're sowing discord, when we're misjudging, when we're mishandling situations, when we're not having patience. We want patience for us, but God is saying um, love is patient, love is kind. So when we remember these attributes, let's remember to ask God to help us. So as we go out this weekend, we encounter certain things. Ask God, let us have a little bit more patience with other people. Because remember, he's still having patience with us. God is still forgiving us. So let's just forgive people. So anybody that we are holding anything against, let's just release all of that now and just give it to the Lord so that we can be free and we can love. When we love, we don't see the fault. And um, that's the beauty of it. God loves us so because of the blood he don't see the fault. And that's how he wants us to be in our relationships, to encourage one another and speak good things. And then we don't see all of the faults in a person. And it's beauty in all of us if we just look at all of those good attributes about all of us. Amen. And I hope I said all of that in love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to the prayer, and um, we're going to close right here. The prayer says, Lord God, help us to honor you as we honor our commitments in marriage and in singleness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Yes.